Well, it, it's really a pleasure for me to be here. I appreciate uh, the invitation, and I'm going to start off by breaking the rules, and I'm going to take a picture in this room. I was in the government, so anything I said behind the scenes should also be on the record, so uh, I'm not too worried about what happens here. I'm really happy to be here. I'm happy for lots of reasons. Uh, normally, when I come up and talk, they, they, thank you, they mention that I have degrees in biology and chemistry and psychology and environmental science and law, but my wife wears the PhD in our family, and so I'm more about quantity of degrees, and she's more like quality of degrees. I won't ask where this audience falls on that question because I think I know. Uh, but today I'm going to talk about can agriculture save the planet before it destroys it? And really what I'm going to be talking about is how do we talk about science and technology? Because I think in many ways that's one of the most important things that we can do. Uh, when I was at the State Department, I had, I think, the best job in the U.S. government. I had basically an unlimited travel budget. I could travel anywhere in the world and just talk about the future of food the role of science, and how do we better communicate with the public. And everywhere I went, I showed up and they said, oh, I thought we invited USDA. And I was like, no, no, the State Department, we care about food too. And then they'd say, well, what's the difference between what you do at State and what they do at USDA? And I'd say, well, that's easy. At USDA, they do things, and at the State Department, we talk about doing things. <laughs> and so today, I'm going to talk about things that other people do, um, and mostly you. And so uh, I am excited. Uh, it mentioned that I was with Intrexon. How many people in the room have heard of Intrexon? Uh, wow, not that many. Um, that's, I was head of communications, so I guess that's my fault. Uh, well, how many have heard of uh, the Arctic apple, non-browned GMO apples? That, that was one of ours. What about the genetically injured mosquitoes fighting Zika? Yep, that was us too. Uh, Aqua bounty salmon? Yep, that was us. So all things controversial. Uh, it was a great job. Uh, so now I, I left about nine months ago, though, and I'm with a f uh, food foresight company. So I, I thought I'd give you like two seconds on uh, what is futurism. And it's not about predicting the future. It's about understanding what are the possible futures there could be and how do we get to the one we want. And so when you look at this picture, uh, when you look at the rearview mirror, that's hindsight. That's where have we come from. And the windshield, well, that's foresight. That's just looking down the road. But insight comes when you're able to look at that GPS and figure out what's around the corner. And so today, also in this presentation, hopefully I help you to think a little bit about how you can look around the corner and get ahead of some of the trends that are impacting you. So starting out, there's nothing we do that has a bigger, more negative impact on the planet than agriculture, but there's nothing more critical for our daily survival. If we were to talk about land, 40% of all the land on Earth that could be devoted to agriculture is being devoted to agriculture today. The amount of cropland the size of South America, the amount of pasture land the size of Africa. So in terms of land, there is nothing more important than agriculture. You know that. If we were to talk about water, this is the Aral Sea back in 1973, probably before some of you were born. And if you fast forward to today, it's no longer a sea at all. And that's largely because of agricultural withdrawals of water. 70% of all fresh water goes to agriculture. It's not just problems in other places here in the United States. The Colorado River, the fifth longest river in America, no longer flows to the sea because of agricultural withdrawals. So these are not the challenges of 2050. These are the realities of today. If we were to talk about climate change, 10 to 15% of all greenhouse gases come from agriculture. Another 10 to 15% come from deforestation. 80% of which is caused by agriculture. Together, that's nearly 30%. That's almost as much as energy, and it's more than anything else. And yet, how much do we hear about energy policy versus agricultural policy? And yet, for every dollar you spend on wind and solar, you get less than a dollar back because they're less efficient than fossil fuels. Now, those are critical, long-term investments for our future. But for every dollar you invest in agriculture, you get $1.43 back everywhere in the world, positive rates of return. So you have to wonder, would consumers rather pay more for their energy or less for their food to get a cleaner environment? Now, what I know of Americans, they'd rather eat their way to a cleaner environment. I can say that because I don't work for the government anymore. So how do we get people to recognize the opportunities presented by agriculture, get them excited about what it can do for us? Now, you know we're going from seven 
to nine, nine and a half billion people by 2050. That's obviously a challenge. But we also have 800 million people that are going to go to bed hungry. We have about nine million people that die every year of hunger. That's more than HIV, road accidents, malaria. You add all of these things up, and it's less than hunger. And yet, how many headlines does hunger get? Not very many. And so part of the challenge, though, is that 9 million is such a big number, it's hard for people to wrap their minds around. So let's think about that. That's 25,000 people will die today of hunger. That's 1,000 people over the next hour. That's one person every four seconds, mostly children. Now, there isn't anybody who wouldn't go help the one child if they saw that they were hungry. But nine million people that we don't see, it's easy for people not to act. How do we get people to understand how critically important the situation is? How do we get them to care? Now, you may have heard that our food system is broken. I hear that a lot today. And now, when you look at 800 million people going to bed hungry, that certainly feels like a broken food system because it's totally unacceptable in the world today that 800 million people would be going to bed hungry. But that's using today as our baseline. If we went back 30 years, that, so 800 million, that's 12% of all the people on the planet are going to bed hungry. But 30 years ago, 24% of all the people on the bed were going to bed hungry. 50 years ago, a third of all the people on the planet went to bed hungry. So by comparison, things are wildly better. Are they good enough? Absolutely not. But if you use today as the baseline, it's easy to say the system is broken. If you use 1950 or 1980 as the baseline, it's clear we're moving in the right direction, just not fast enough. How we frame this conversation is critically important. If you look at life expectancy back in 1951 and you fast forward to today, it's remarkably better. The worst countries in the world uh, today look like the best countries in the world just back in 1951. People don't understand how far we've come, how much we've accomplished. If you were to look at, however, obesity, and you look at around the world, Virtually no countries had obesity rates above 10% just in 1975. And of course, if you look at it today, many countries, a third of all the people are obese. Two thirds are overweight or obese. So there are real problems associated with agriculture. I'm not trying to hide that. But there are remarkable progress as well. For the first 10,000 years of human civilization, the only question that scientists and farmers were being asked was to produce more food. So we're at that critical moment in human history in which we're being asked to produce food more nutritiously. So it's a transition point, and that's going to create challenges. But how we talk about it, we need to recognize where we've come from to understand where we're going. And if you think about what we need to do, we need to produce between 60 and 100% more food by 2050. And we need to do it using less land, less water, fewer resources and inputs and fertilizer and other things. We have to do everything better tomorrow than we're doing today, and our rivers and lakes are already running dry. That's a challenge. But again, where do we start? What's our starting point? If you ask consumers today, most people feel like agriculture is moving in the wrong direction. Things are bad and getting worse. And yet, if you look at the resources necessary to produce a bushel of corn between 1980 and 2011, what you find is today we use 35% fewer greenhouse gases to produce that bushel. There's 40% less land needed, 40% less energy, 50% less water, and there's 60% less erosion on that land. By every measure, things are wildly better. We could do this for canola and cotton and soybeans. We could do this in many countries around the world. The baseline is critically important. Many environmental groups, when they talk about the impact of agriculture on the planet, they're using today as the baseline. And the problem with that is that when you look at eutrophication of waterways and all of those things which are real, it makes it seem like the farmers and the scientists are the problem to be solved. But when you use 1980 as the baseline, it's clear that scientists and farmers are the solution to our problem. 
the baseline we use is critically important, how we frame the conversation. So if you look at, uh, it's not about good or bad or right or wrong, it's about choices and consequences. So if you look at European agriculture over the next decade, we expect to, it to increase by maybe 4% just ahead of sub-Saharan Africa. But of course, demand in Europe will increase much faster than that, met by the country which sends the most food to Europe, Brazil. So Europe, uh, Brazil will increase its agricultural production by about 40%, driven by demand in its two largest markets, Europe and China. So it's not about good or bad, but it is about choices and consequences. So in many ways, Europe has taken and exported its environmental footprint for agriculture to the most biodiverse country on the planet. That might not be a good idea, but they can afford to do it. They don't have to produce it themselves. 70% of all the animal feed consumed in Europe is imported from Brazil, is imported. And almost all of it's GMO, and yet consumers in Europe believe that GMOs are not relevant to their market. They don't understand, they don't know. So they oppose it without realizing the relevance and importance to their markets. How do we convey information in a way that people are interested in getting it and not shutting their eyes to it? Well, we have these competing views of how our food should be produced. On one hand, we have a slow food movement that says we should produce the food the way we did 100 years ago. And we have a fast food, high tech intensive concept that says we need to be faster, more intensively. You guys might be in part of this. So how do we, though, take these two trends that are moving in different directions today and find a way to bring them together so that we have the strength of both systems instead of fighting each other and tearing each other down and undermining consumer confidence in the entire food system? It's not going to be helpful to do that. Now, I like to say that people love innovation almost as much as they despise change. And there is no place that people despise change more than in the food they eat. Because food is what brings us together with friends, with family. And if you mess with my food, you're messing with my family, and people don't like that. But if we don't change how we produce food, everything will change. Our way of life will change. So in order to keep what we have, we need to change the systems that we have in place. And we need to convey that in a way that people are open to it and excited about it. Now, a lot of this has to do with how consumers think about food. And unfortunately, when consumers have a false belief, it's usually easier to cater to that belief if you're a company than to try to eradicate it. So now I want you to imagine the conversation that took place between the regulatory scientist and the marketing guy when they were thinking about what to do with their water here. This is hemp, and I'm gonna, you can't read it very well, so I'll, I'll make it bigger. So they're having this conversation, and the marketing guy is thinking, how do we get people to drink more of our water? You know what's trending today? Gluten-free. And the regulatory scientist is saying, well, you know our water, it's gluten-free. And the marketing guy's like, what? You're kidding, right? He's like, well, well, no, it, it's gluten-free. And he's like, next thing you're going to tell me it's vegan. And he's like, well, well, yeah, I guess it kind of is. He's like, is it kind of or is it is? Yeah, 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 it is. And he's like, and now, and then he finds out it's non-GMO, and he's just like all natural. He's like, his mind is blown. He is so excited. We are going to own the vegan, gluten-free, no preservative, non-GMO water market. And of course, the regulatory scientist is like, I, I don't understand, no water. And he's like, God, I, don't, I don't need any more. I've got all of me I need. Now, the thing is that they might actually sell the water and make an extra dollar a bottle based on these uh, labels but it also undermines confidence because at some point, someday, the consumer's like, what do you mean all water's vegan? And they're like, I may have been overspending. And so it undermines confidence, not just in a product, but in a system. And we all pay the price when consumers don't trust the food they eat. Now, uh-oh, moving too fast. So, I'd like to talk a little bit about how our concept of food has changed over time. 
Because if you went back to the 1950s and 60s and you asked people, what does the future of food look like? Yeah, it looks a little bit like this. And people were so excited. They're like, oh, I've got my TV dinner. And they take it into the living room and they put it in front of the TV and they sit and they eat. And it's like, oh, processed. Love it. <laughs> you know, people were excited because, you know, science in food was a good thing. People had atomic gardens where they were planting irradiated seeds and they were excited about it. But things change. And if you go to the 1980s, 1890s to 90s, this is the age of aspiration. And if you start at the beginning of the 1980s and you went into the grocery store and you wanted to buy uh, tomato sauce for your pasta, you had two choices. You could have ragu and prego, or prego and ragu. That was it. But by the end of the 1980s, you could get chunky. You could get spicy. You could get it with meat sauce. I mean, it's like the world was open. You want garlic? Yeah. Oregano? Yeah. So we had all these choices. And so some of you are old enough to remember the great Poupon commercials. And it was an age of aspiration. Our food purchases told people something about us. It was the time in which Americans were introduced to choice. It wasn't about just having enough food. It was about having the right food. Our relationship to food was forever changed. And today we live in the age of conspicuous production, not consumption. Conspicuous consumption is where you, know, you want to buy something that your neighbor can't have so you can see that they, you have it, but they can't. Conspicuous production is that we want to know where did things come from. We want to know the provenance of our foods. And we want to know the story behind the foods that we eat. And so the story behind this coffee is that there's, in Indonesia, there's this civet cat, and it likes to eat the uh, coffee beans, and then somebody follows around the civet cat, I guess, after it does its business and collects those coffee beans, and I assume they wash them before they grind it. Um, <laughs> and people pay a lot of money for that. Apparently, it's a great story. And so people want to know, though, where do things come from? And they want their purchases to be an extension of their values, and that's whether it could be for environmental sustainability or social justice or animal welfare. We want our purchases to mean something. So it's not just having enough food. It's not just having foods that say something about us, uh, our choice, but it's also about uh, an extension of our value. So again, our relationship to food has changed. And it's not just the relationship of consumers because we are consumers. How we think about food has changed over time. So, how many people in the room have heard of The Wizards and the Prophet, the, the book? The Wizard and the Prophet. Yeah, a fair number of people. So this is the story of Norman Borlaug, the father of the Green Revolution, and William Vogt, the father of the environmental movement. And in this book, uh, Norman Borlaug is the wizard, Vogt is the prophet. Sort of Borlaug's view is that science is the solution to our problem. And in a sense, Vogt's is that science is the problem to be solved. And so if you haven't read the book, that's a summary. But I know that we have a lot of millennials in the room. And so it's actually exactly the same story that you will find in uh, Avengers Infinity War. Same story. You don't even need to read the book. Just watch the movie. And so I, spoilers for those who have already seen it. So in the, in the movie, you've got an actual wizard, Doctor Strange. And at one moment, he talks about Thanos as the prophet. And Thanos wants to eliminate half the beings in the universe because they just consume too much stuff. And if there weren't so many of us, then we'd all be better off. Well, you know, there's, there's something in that science isn't good enough to solve our problems. But, you know, Iron Man, he was all about science. He can solve our problems. Same story. Just watch the movie. Don't read the book. No, I, you should read the book, too. So, but it's important because people can be put into those categories. Are you a wizard? Or are you a, a prophet? And I assume that most of the people in this room are wizards. You believe that science is the solution to our problems. But if you're talking to somebody who is a prophet and believes that in many ways science has caused the problems we have, you need to be able to talk to them where they are. The more you talk about science, the more you're going to scare the heck out of them. So understanding where people are is critical to being able to communicate to them. You can't do it from your perspective if you're the one trying to share information with them. Now, it's also important to recognize that consumers have never cared more nor known less how their food is produced. And that's a challenge for all of us, because consumers care passionately today about how their food is produced, and they're asking for policy changes based on that, and they haven't a clue 
what food production is really like. And so, unfortunately, that can mean that they ask for policy changes that don't actually achieve their own goals. And that's a problem. If somebody wants a policy and it helps them achieve what they want, that's one thing. But if they're not actually achieving sustainability or improved nutrition or other things, that is a problem. So how do we help to align consumers' interest in solving problems and the policies that they advocate for? That's a challenge. Now, if you look at uh, these packages, again, part of the problem is that how food and agriculture system is marketed to the public and the reality aren't necessarily the same. And so you look at these packages of this beautiful, idyllic farm where the animals are happily led to slaughter. You know, is that really what most farms in America look like? This is dog food. Do the dogs really care about the farm? They're just like, open the package, open the package, open the package. It's like my kids. So how do we deal with that, though? Because this, if you market a vision of the agricultural system that's inconsistent with the agricultural system, how can you get mad at consumers for not understanding the agricultural system? There's this disconnect, and it's leading to skeptical consumers. That's part of the problem, is that they're being marketed in a uh, vision of the system that's inconsistent, and it makes them skeptical about everybody in the system. Now, when I was in the government, I spent a lot of time talking about the difference between hazard and risk. This is an audience that understands it well. But for most people, we're hardwired to understand hazards. We're not hardwired to understand risk unless we're a statistician and nobody wants to talk to them. So what are we going to do? It's a challenge. So I used to try to explain, I'd give an analogy. I'd say, look, a plane crash is a really big hazard, but your exposure is low or you wouldn't be here. On the other hand, a, plane, a car crash, smaller hazard, greater exposure, riskier to drive than to fly. Seemed like a winner to me, doesn't matter. We're hardwired to understand hazards and risks. So then I'm like, OK, shark in the ocean is a hazard. When you're on the beach, not much of a risk. But when you get into the water, they're like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Still don't understand it. OK, so the problem is all I have to do is say it can cause cancer. And people are like, it causes cancer? I, I didn't say that. I said, it can cause cancer. It causes cancer. No. So you can't unring that bell. If you say it can, that means it does. And so it means that for all of us. So we need to recognize how our minds work. And so I eventually realized I should stop talking about hazard times exposure equals risk. And I should start talking about hazard times media exposure equals perception of risk. Because that's what we're talking about, right? You know, People worry about what they're told to worry about. How could it be any different? I eventually realized that this is what I call the tweetification of risk. Somebody hears a crazy story that their cousin's nephew's aunt, uncle told them. And they tweet it because they've got five followers. And it goes to their 10, and then a 1,000, then a million. And then it's off way around the world. And you know, you've got an entire weekend uh, trying to do uh, control, uh, crisis management for, for this. So things move really quickly today in a way they didn't in the past. And if you're not part of the conversation, you're going to get run over by the conversation. So when I was in the government, we had to think about, well, when should we communicate with the public? Now, it's easy during the flu season, like right now, when risk is high and media attention is low. We know we should be part of that conversation. But what about when risk is low? and media attention is high. Well, for most regulators, they'd be like, well, that's not a real risk. But I'll tell you, if consumers think it's a risk, and they ask for policy changes because they think it's a risk, I guarantee you that becomes a real risk. If you're not part of the conversation, you're going to get run over by it. So then the question was, well, what should you communicate? And sadly, if I were to look at my talking points from in the government, they would look something like this. Research shows it's safe. We're going to feed the world. But research also shows these just turn people off. You start talking about feeding the world, and they're like, click, I'm going to go to sleep. Wake me up when it's over. Uh, so the problem is that if you lead with science, you will lose with science. I know, that's pretty disappointing. So, the problem is with science, when you lead with science, those who agree with you agree with you more. 
and those who disagree, disagree more. And that's a problem for those of us who do really love science, that we can't really start there. We feel like that should be the starting point, but it turns out it's the end point. So if you think about what kinds of things do people worry about, well, you know, on the top are things like terrorist attacks and other things that they do worry about, and of course on the bottom are the things they should worry about. There's very little correlation between what people worry about and what they should worry about. The correlation is between what you worry about and what you see on TV and you read about on the internet. We worry about the things we're told to worry about. How could it be any different? We don't worry about things we don't know about. How could it be any different? Or if you look at the causes that we donate to, on the left are uh, the different causes that raise the most money, uh, breast cancer and other things, and on the right are the things that kill us. You would expect there to be a bit of a correlation between where we give our money and the things that kill us, but no. If somebody comes to your door and they ask for a donation, maybe you give it. If nobody comes and nobody knocks and nobody asks, why would you? So we need to recognize these are not just things that other people do. These are things that we all do. If we don't understand how our own minds operate, we really can't engage with others in how they do it. Now, this is not my daughter, but it could be. She's not the most dynamic eater in the world. Uh, she hates it when I use this slide. She thinks I only do it when she's in the audience. Uh, but how do we talk about food in a way that engages people and doesn't turn them off? That's what we have to figure out. So how many people in the room have eaten a Chinese gooseberry? Just raise your hand. Now, that's, that's a lot of hands, considering uh, you know, most audience is like two. All right, so I'm really hoping that at some point you guys will try it. How many people would love to try a Chinese gooseberry that haven't? All right, a lot of adventurous people. Well, maybe they'll have kiwi fruit out there for dinner. That would be great. So the thing is that how we talk about food matters. So back in 1910, some intrepid kiwi went to China, found the Chinese gooseberry, brought it back to New Zealand, and most importantly, created a new, uh, created a new variety, but most importantly, then rebranded it and the rest is history. Because when it's a Chinese gooseberry, I hate to tell you, but it's a hairy fruit. But when it's a kiwi, it's really cute and fuzzy. <laughs> it's like the world changes with that marketing. I don't know what they did. But how we talk about food has a powerful impact on how we engage. So how many of you have heard this idea that if you can't pronounce the ingredients in the food, you shouldn't eat it? You guys familiar with that one? Do you guys beat people up when they say that? You know, I, I, only pronounce, I only eat things if I can pronounce the ingredients. You know, it drives the scientists in the room crazy when people say things like that because we know that makes no sense. And so we try to beat people up with science when they don't understand. Or you could just show them a picture like this. And it shows the ingredients in food. And it turns out you can't pronounce any of them. Well, you guys can pronounce all of them, but I can't pronounce any of them. And people look at this, and they laugh, and they get it. So instead of beating people up with science, find a way to lead them to knowledge. People love to learn things. They just don't like to be told things. How many people go on uh, the internet and watch TED Talks about things that they have no reason to watch because they're just interested in learning something new? People do it all the time. If people present information in a way that's engaging, people will watch for hours. Lead people to knowledge. Don't beat them up with science. Now, sometimes people ask me, what's the scariest food you know? And I always say, the seedless watermelon. Unless I'm speaking to the seedless watermelon people, then I use a different example. I used to say that jokingly. And then last year, I was speaking to the National Restaurant Association, and I get to that point, and I make that same statement, and I look up in the back of the room, and it says, sponsored by the National Watermelon Association. <laughs> uh, I did a little damage control, I have to admit. There's some legal disclosures that I'll have at the end. We've agreed on certain things. So the thing is, I was thinking about this. Where do they come from? They don't have any seeds. Kind of blows your mind. 
So I did a little research on the internet, so I'm pretty sure it's true. <laughs> so apparently you start with a normal watermelon and you expose it to colchicine, which is a natural plant extract, which is, which is highly toxic and mutagenic. I added a skull and crossbones, so you'll be more concerned. But it still, it ends up with a watermelon, four sets of chromosomes, but it still produces seed. So then you cross that back with the original watermelon, you end up with a watermelon with three sets of chromosomes, which is so screwed up, it will not produce seeds. And that's the one you eat. No nutritional analysis, no food safety evaluation, conventional breeding. Now, if somebody were saying produced with mutagens, some consumers might be a, a concern. If somebody said three sets of chromosomes, you can imagine the consumer reaction, well, I don't do DNA. My doctor said it gives me indigestion. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm cutting out all DNA, just I don't do it. So they could be concerned, but of course they're not because nobody's telling them to. Now, I'm not trying to convince you to stop eating seedless watermelons. That's part of my agreement with the Watermelon Association. But there are ways to convince, convey information in a way that's like, that could sound scary, but it doesn't. If people are laughing, they're with you. And they're having fun, and they're engaged, and they're learning. How do we talk about things? Now, if there's one thing you leave this uh, presentation remembering, it's that you should not trust your brain. Our brains are lying to us all the time. They mislead us every day. They can't be trusted. Hopefully they're not listening. So I want to give you some examples. So the first is just this visual illusion. So you've got two squares here. Which one looks darker? Raise your hand if the one on the top looks darker. Okay, most hands went up, not all. Some people don't trust me. Fair, fair point. Okay, so what's going on here? Well, if we pull out the circles here, what we find is that they look similar, but not necessarily the same. But if we cover it up, they look the same. So what's happening? I'm going to undo it. So our brain thinks that the top one is in direct light. So it must actually be darker. It's color correcting for us. And it thinks the bottom part is in shadow. So it's lightening it up a little bit. But of course, it's a picture. So that doesn't work. So it's totally messing with us. So it's trying to help, but it's not. And so it doesn't matter that you know the colors are the same. You can't see them as the same. So knowing something and perceiving something can be very different. Our brains are not to be trusted. Another example. This one's called the bat and the ball problem. This is a simple math problem. Any fifth, fifth graders can get it right. Only 80% of you will get it wrong. The smarter you are, the more likely you are to get it wrong. Don't worry. We will not be recording the reactions. So when you get the answer, though, I want you to shout it out. It'll help. So a bat and a ball together cost a dollar and ten cents. The bat cost a dollar more than the ball. How much does the ball cost? Answer. I heard some ten cents, maybe some five. So we're going to do the math, though. If the ball cost ten cents and the bat cost a dollar more, that would be a dollar and ten cents. One ten plus ten, one twenty. Not our answer. Five cents plus a dollar and five, one ten. Now we can all do the math. But if we hadn't stopped to do the math, many of you would have left this room thinking, oh, that was a crazy simple problem, that Jack's an idiot. Now, this does not prove that I'm not an idiot, but it does prove that you might have been wrong. So our brain, we have two parts of our brain. We have a fast thinking part of our brain and a slow thinking part. And that fast thinking part answers questions like that really quick. And the slow thinking part does the math, but it's really lazy. It won't do the math unless it knows it needs to do the math. And it generally doesn't know that. So imagine you're walking down the grocery store shelf, making quick decisions about your nutrition and the health of your family, thinking you got it all covered. But that slow thinking part of your brain that does the math, it's just, it's taking a nap. It's not doing anything. So again, this isn't what other people do. This is what we all do. This is part of what leads us to make bad choices. So, so there are also mental shortcuts that lead us to make other decisions. And so one of them is something called confirmation bias. These shortcuts get us through our day, but confirmation bias is that tendency to look for information that's consistent with our beliefs and avoid information that's not. 
And it's important to think about examples of how we're biased. It doesn't help. We can easily identify confirmation bias in others. That's not a problem. In ourselves, though, so I like to give an example. So if I were to read an article that said, organic agriculture, more nutritious than conventional, what would I do? I would ask, who are the authors, who funded the research, and what was their methodology? Pretty reasonable things to do, right? But what if the article said, organic, no more nutritious than conventional? What would I do? I'd tweet it, right? <laughs> it's, it's consistent with what I believe. It's got to be true. I'm sure those guys are great. So if I read the first one, though, and I started digging deeper into who those people are and found out one of them worked on an organic farm when they were in high school, I'd be like, aha, that person's biased. But of course, it wouldn't demonstrate their bias. It would demonstrate mine. We need to understand how we're biased in order to talk to others about theirs. Another one of these uh, biases is the availability heuristic, which is a complicated way of saying, when I say a word, what comes to mind? So when I say the word natural, what words come to mind? Are you guys thinking butterflies and rainbows and puppies and salmonella and Zika and Ebola? Because all the bad things are natural too, right? So the problem is that we all go to these happy places when we hear the, the word natural. Everybody does. So again, we need to understand how we're misled, and it's our brain that does this to us. So I know I need to move on before we, I run out of time here. So one of the things I want to leave you with, though, is that all of us need to become better storytellers. We need to do a better job of telling people where we come from. And to do that, you need to be able to personalize your own story. Too many of the scientists I talk to start by telling me all the exciting work they're doing. And that's fine when they're talking to me, but they also do it when they're talking to the general public. And the general public doesn't have an appreciation for why you do what you do. So start by telling people why you're in the research area that you are. Acknowledging people's concerns. For 13 years at the State Department, I never once met a single person who was anti-science. I met a lot of people who didn't trust the government and didn't trust big business, but they all love science. It's just when science and values conflict, values always win. They win for us, they win for others. And we need to acknowledge that. It doesn't mean you agree with them, but if you understand when somebody says that they want something GMO-free or gluten-free, what they're really saying is that they want something healthy and safe for their family. And they really don't care about that other thing. And you share that underlying value, and that's an opportunity. It's an opportunity to connect with other people. And if we can connect with others, we can begin to build trust. And it's only at the point that we have trust that science has a role to play in the conversation. So when I was still at the State Department, I was giving a similar talk to a group of 800 meat scientists. It was as exciting as it sounds. And so I said to them, if people don't trust you, science doesn't matter. And if people do trust you, science doesn't matter. Stop telling people what you do and tell them why you do it. If people get the why, they don't care about the what. Tell people what you do or why you do it. And you all have great stories. There are great reasons that you're doing it. Now, I want to give you an example of looking around the corner. So we've all heard about transparency. We know how important it is. But how important do you think transparency will be to the average consumer 10 years from now or 20 years from now? Do you think it will be even more important than it is today? Well, I don't think it will be important at all. I don't think consumers will care about transparency in 20 years. Because transparency today is where food safety was in 100 years ago. 100 years ago, consumers cared about food safety because the food wasn't safe. 10 or 20 years from now, our food system will be transparent and nobody will care anymore. So when you think about that, today there's this opportunity. If you provide transparency to a consumer today, you can get a bonus for it. They will, they will give you a bonus for having done that. 10 years from now, you will only be punished for not being transparent. So today you can be rewarded. In the future, you will only be punished. So decide. 
Do you want to choose to be rewarded for what you have to do, or do you want to be dragged into doing it and then be punished nevertheless? So understanding where it's going is helpful to understand what you might need to do today. So if we went back to 1969, people would have been reading the population bomb, which basically said within a decade, a billion people were going to die in Pakistan, India, and Africa. And it recommended that we let them die. We should stop sending food aid to those regions. We were just perpetuating the misery. But of course, that billion people didn't die, and they didn't die because the Green Revolution was well underway. Norman Borlaug would win the Nobel Peace Prize in just 1970. Now, I'm a science optimist. I have no doubt that science and technology can get us where we need to be. But I'm a regulatory pessimist. I'm not at all convinced you'll be allowed to take us there. You see, science tells us what we can do, but the public tells us what we should do. And if the public doesn't trust you, doesn't trust us to deliver those benefits, they won't allow us to do it. So I'd like to leave you with the thought that you need to engage. You need to be part of the conversation. You need to add your voice. And if you do, we can build that trust. And if we build that trust, agriculture can and will save the planet. Thank you. Sure. So uh, we're going to, can we get the lights up, please? Uh, we're going to uh, actually uh, be willing to answer a few questions. If you decide to leave, to go to the uh, reception, please do so quietly so people can ask questions. So uh, we have uh, mics in two places in the room. Uh, and if somebody has questions, please go to a mic and, and ask short questions, no lectures, folks. <laughs> and I see all of the experts are leaving the room because they know how it works. Okay, we have a question over here, yes, please. Uh, so this is just kind of a basic question. Um, how do we as scientists help support and build public trust in science when our, there are government leaders that are very anti-science right now? Well. There are a lot of people in the government, though, and there are a lot of people participating in these conversations. You have people from USDA, they're, they're in the room out there, um, who believe passionately in science. And not everybody is involved in every conversation. And so I think that most of these conversations are happening one-on-one. -on -one. They're not necessarily the conversation that's happening between uh, the government and the people, it's between the scientists and the people. If you look at trust, trust in scientists is actually quite high. People say that it's not, but if you look at tr uh, confidence and interest in supporting investments in, agri in science, it's as high as it's ever been, if not higher. So, so there is that opportunity. I don't think you have to get into that conversation about whether or not the government is trustworthy in order to be able to answer the question whether or not people need to trust you. That's just a different question. And you can't solve the government's problem, but you can solve yours. Over here, please. You talked about 800 million people per day not having enough um, calories. But that's largely a geopolitical problem. It's not that there's not enough food produced. And maybe we could refocus over the next 30 years on addressing food waste. Because about half the calories of the US consumption daily are just wasted. And in the developed world, not having uh, post-harvest quality or any technologies that maintain food in a good condition, if we could solve that problem. So I think we, in this room, we need to be aware that it's not always about food production. Yeah, it's not always about food production. But let me give you an example. Let's say that we get to 2050, we've doubled productivity, and it turns out we don't need the food. Well, that means we will have cut in half the impact of agriculture on the planet. So there's no scenario in which food productivity doesn't lead to a dramatically better world. But that also doesn't mean that we shouldn't focus on uh, reducing food waste and other things. But, but there are complexities. I mean, nobody in the food system actually benefits from food waste. You know, if you're a grower, you don't want to waste food in the field. If you're a shipper, you don't. If you're a grocery. So it's, food waste is not a problem. It's, it's 10,000 problems be, based on each food. 
Um, we've gotten remarkably good at actually squeezing a lot of that out. When I grew up, we would cut the fat off at home, then it was done at the butcher, and now it's done, and there's basically zero waste in terms of livestock. Um, but other things to think about, 40% of food waste in America happens post-consumer. So let's say we eliminated tomorrow, there's no more waste for after the consumer. Well, if consumers don't buy 40% of food, nobody makes 40% of food. It's not like that 40% gets magically transported somewhere else. If there's no demand for food, nobody produces it. So, so things are complicated, and we see this when you took the ugly fruit and you convinced people that it was worth buying, well, food banks stopped getting food. So the impact of that was a massive reduction in donations to food banks. That doesn't mean we shouldn't do it, but you know, it is complicated. So I, uh, I think we need to focus on it, we need to do it. Everything that makes it easier to get to that goal is helpful. Steve, last question. <clears throat> and I'm gonna stick around. Feel free to connect to me on social media, LinkedIn, whatever you wanna do. What do you think the future is for things like Impossible Foods and other meatless hamburgers? So if we need to double the amount of protein by 2050, uh, I think we need an all of the above approach that, you know, there, there's no way that the plant-based foods are gonna become a trillion dollar industry in just 30 years. And even if they did, there wouldn't be a single reduction in cattle. So they have to become a $2 trillion industry in order for, and not even the companies in that space believe that that's gonna happen. But choice is a important consumer trend. They will continue to choose different types of protein sources. Uh, so I think that it will continue to have an impact, but it's not going to have an impact in terms of reducing livestock consumption or dairy consumption in the, the next 30 years. So, yeah. Thank you. Let's thank our speaker again, please.